Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Sweeney, Texas. This is our sermon portion of our worship service from Sunday, September 18th, 2016. The Reverend W.C. Hall was our guest speaker, and the title of his sermon was Heeding Good Advice. Keep loving each other like family. Don't neglect to open your homes to guests, because by doing this, some have been host to angels without knowing it. Remember prisoners as if you were in prison with them, and people who are mistreated as if you were in their place. Marriage must be honored in every respect with no cheating on the relationship because God will judge the sexually immoral person and the person who commits adultery. Your way of life should be free from the love of money and you should be content with what you have. After all, he has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. This is why we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper and I won't be afraid. What can people do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke God's word to you. Imitate their faith as you consider the way their lives turned out. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 1 through 8, Common English Bible. God has for you and me. And then there is the kind of love that is spoken of here. It's a love that can be expressed as we are a part of a family. I have become convinced that churches are going to be judged not so much by what they believe as the kind of love they share with one another. You know, I think for too many of us, we have spent our entire lives talking about the Apostles' Creed, forgetting that the New Testament emphasizes to us not so much the doctrines of the church as the need to love one another like God loves us, to be a part of God's family. Now, I, I have cousins who are members of the Church of Christ and they think I'm going to hell in a hand basket. They think that because I'm not a member of the Church of Christ. I told them that when I die, I'm going to find a room in heaven where they are because there's got to be a room for just the Church of Christ so they'll think they're the only ones up there. <laughs> And when I find that room, I'm going to sneak up to the window and raise the window and yell, Surprise! I made it! <laughs> because I don't think we're going to be judged by what church we're in or what we necessarily believe about baptism. But don't think it's just the Church of Christ that has that problem. I've served Methodist churches that have that problem. Matter of fact, uh, I served the church in Belleville, Texas, that had that problem. They asked for me to leave. They asked me to leave because I could not stand in good faith and tell them that I believe every word literally in this Bible. Now, I know people that tell me that they believe every word. They even believe the maps. But the first thing that says to me is they hadn't read it. How many of you believe that you're going to hell if you eat shrimp? Well, that's what the Bible says. How many of you believe you're going to hell and eat oysters? That's what the Bible says. Or if you have a son that disobeys you, well, the way you solve that is you take him out to the edge of town and you stone him to death. Try that and I'll come visit you in Huntsville. <laughs> you see, I think that people who say they believe every word from kibber to kibber 
really young. But I had to leave. I know that it's hard always to love people that we disagree with. But it's part of the family of God. It seems to me imperative that we realize that love transcends what we believe. Even transcends politics. Love is that which I think we're going to be judged by. When I was uh, a lot younger than I am, <coughs> there was a wonderful song that I used to like called If I Had a Hammer. And uh, if I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. And you know, I got to thinking about that song not long ago. And there are probably some people that didn't take a hammer. <laughs> it take a hammer to convince them that love should be what we are judged by. I have long admired the speech that Martin Luther King gave when he said that he looked for a day when his little children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. <coughs> My friends, we are judged by the love that we share with one another, regardless if we're pink or purple, regardless of whether we're black or yellow or green or white. God loves us all and expects us to love one another. And then the writer of Hebrews goes on to get really personal and says to us that we should not tie ourselves to the love of money. We live in a very materialistic society. We are judged a lot on the basis of how much money we have. The kind of house we live in. The kind of car that we drive. My friends, we need to go back and look seriously at what the New Testament says about money. I wanted to share with you what Paul had to say in writing to Timothy about money. In the sixth chapter, starting with the sixth verse, Paul wrote this. There is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we should be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the law of money is the root of all evil. Notice that Paul does not say money is the root of all evil. He says the love of money is the root of all evil. And yet we live in a world that I really think, you know, the, the anthem that the world understands is money makes the world go round, the world go round, and the world go round. A lot of people really believe that. A lot of people that are our neighbors. I uh, am amazed at what Paul went on to say in that sixth chapter of First Timothy. 
I share with you starting in verse 17. As for the rich in this world, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God who richly furnishes us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life which is life indeed. You know, that really, that verse really came home to me when I was a young preacher. I, I was a preacher at the time at Crystal Beach in Fort Ball. I went there for Matagora. They thought my feet were wet. <laughs> the next church I thought was going to be on the third sandbar. <laughs> but I took a vacation with some friends and went to Cozumel, Mexico. I had never seen water like that in my life. Put in Galveston wherever, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but we rented snorkels and, and, and masks and fins and I had never seen something so beautiful in all my life. But I forgot about the sun. <laughs> I put on a t-shirt, I, I didn't have sense enough to do that, but I am Caucasian, my friends, and there's never been any doubt about that. And I put a third degree burn on the backs of my legs while I was smoking. And ruined that vacation, the doctor had to come to the hotel where we were staying twice to give me shots. The backs of my legs turned blackish purple. It was awful. But one of the insights that came out of that incident was that the wonderful women who cleaned the rooms there at the motel came to check on me every couple of hours. They were so nice. They brought me things that I could drink, like a Coke or something like that, and took care of me. I speak a little Spanish, poco a poco, <laughs> and in trying to say thank you, I, I, I got into a conversation with a lady and found out that uh, she was interested to know what I did for a living. And I told her that I was a poor Methodist preacher. And she wanted to know how much money I made. <coughs> and at the time, I made $4,800 a year. And she looked at me in disbelief. And she said, Senor, my family lived on $400 last year. And that's when the scales fell off of my eyes. And I realized that in the sight of the world, I was not a poor Methodist preacher. I was rich. You know, I live in an air-conditioned house. As you can tell by looking at my waistline, I haven't missed any meal. I enjoy life that many people in this world can only dream about. And you do too. Not, not that I don't struggle, because I do. I, I have problems like you do. 
One of those problems came just as I was getting ready to retire. Uh, the lay leader for our church was a high school English teacher. One day he said, let me see, I got this kid that I just am worried about. He's very, very bright. But I don't know if he's going to graduate because he's homeless. He's been to 12 high schools. And this was right before Christmas. He said he's supposed to graduate in May, but he's having to live from house to house who will ever take him in for a week. Is there any chance that you can let him live with you until he graduates? I said, oh, I'm an old man. What, what do I know about kids? He said, you know a lot about kids. You can do it. Well, to make a long story relatively short, I did it. And Luis came to live with me and graduated from high school, joined the Marines, and went out to California for basic. I thought it was all over. But about four months later, I got a phone call, and he said, they just discharged me. I've developed asthma. Can I come to your house? Oh, my God. Home was 2464 Liberty Street in Beaumont, Texas. And that kid started Lamar. He, he's one of the few students that took nine years to graduate. <clears throat> he graduated, I, you know, I, th I think he majored in everything you could possibly major in. <laughs> And about two years into it, he said, Baby, see, my little brother's going to graduate from high school. Can he come and live with us and go to college? And I said, Luis, we are barely squeaking by now on their borrowed money. He said, Yeah, but if he don't come here, he'll never go to college. And I ended up saying, Okay. And Miguel came, and he went to college. They both graduated, thank the Lord. W.C. still paying for it. You know, I'm amazed at how much college costs these days. A lot more than when I went to college, I'll tell you that. Uh, I, I have two books I've written that, that I'm selling in hopes of paying off that debt before I die. If any of you are interested, they're out in the foyer there. One of them's a book of funny things that have happened to me in my life, and others a collection of sermons. But God told me again in no uncertain terms. Money does not make this world go round. Love makes this world go round. And if you love money more than you love God's children, there's something terribly wrong. One of the great books that, that I have uh, recently read is a book that's called Mama Magnet. If you read one book this year, read Mama Maggie. It is the story of a woman who lives in Egypt of all places. And in that Muslim country, this Christian woman has had a ministry to the people who live in the dumps. Now you and I have never seen anything like that. I went with Bishop Copeland over to the Holy Land in Egypt a number of years ago. 
and they took us to the dumps. And I thought, you know, I came here to see the pyramids, not the dumps. There were over a hundred thousand people living in the dumps. Mama Maggie has made it her life mission to minister to those people. It's very difficult for Christians to get title to land in Cairo. But they have title to the dump. And that's where most of the Christians live. And not only did they take us there, but they also took us to a cave there in the dump where the Christians have carved out a church that seats 18,000 people. We have trouble filling this sanctuary. We who have everything and they who have nothing fill a sanctuary of 18,000 people. They should stop and think, brother. They took us to the cemetery there in Cairo, to what they call the City of the Dead. It's four miles of cemetery. But what's unique is that there are over a hundred thousand people living in the cemetery in cardboard boxes on tops of graves. I've never seen anything like it. This woman is making a difference in the name of Jesus Christ. We can make a difference too if we are those who share God's love with others. You don't have to be a millionaire. All you have to do is share what you have. Because you see, the writer of Hebrews ends that passage by reminding us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he places on you and me as his disciples the responsibility to share that good news with other people. He places on us the responsibility of saying to this world, God makes a difference in my life, and God can make a difference in your life too. Not long ago, Luis, the oldest of the boys, was visiting me, and he sat at the table with me, and he said, You know, let me see, I've been thinking. If I hadn't met you, I probably would be in prison. And I think that's probably a pretty accurate kind of way of looking at it. That boy told me stories that I didn't even want to know. He had done things that I couldn't believe. But Jesus Christ has made a difference in his life, even as he has made a difference in my life. Because even though this old world is filled with problems, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I don't know what the future holds any more than you do. But I know this. The one hope that this world has 
is in Jesus Christ our Lord. May his name be blessed forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you love us and call us your children. Help us, Lord, to love one another. Help us, Lord, to be faithful that brotherly and sisterly love might continue and that we might not be caught up in the trap of loving money more than we love your children. Make of our hands your hands. And make of our lives that which truly reflects the good news of the gospel. And we will give you thanks and praise. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us for worship, and we hope that you'll join us again next week, either live in person or here online. For more information on our church, visit our website at www.sweeneyumc.org.